Hi there. I'm Bruce Fumi. I'm in the Otago Settlers Museum and welcome to today's episode of This Day in Scottish History. Uh, now, the part of the museum that I'm in just now is a mock-up of the steerage quarters for the passengers on the ship Philip Lang. Why am I here? Some of you will know that I'm from Perth, but do you know that there are five places at least called Perth in the world. Uh, there are 56 places called Douglas, there are uh, 26 Edinburgh's, 25 Glasgow's and 75 Hamilton's. Now if you're a proud Scot, you're probably thinking, I hope there's only one Paisley. European city of culture? I'm not bitter. There are 36 Edinburgh's. Now the Gaelic word for Edinburgh is Danachan and there are at least two places in the world where people have cocked up the pronunciation and called their towns Dunedin and I'm in one of them. Uh, it's in the South Island of New Zealand and with the possible exception of Waipu and the North Island it's the most Scottish place that I've ever been outside Scotland. In fact it's probably more Scottish than some places I've been in Scotland. Uh, big shout out to the population of St Andrews. So why? Well, if you've been watching these series, uh, you've probably heard me talk about the conflicts between Catholics and Protestants in Scottish history. It may shock you to find out that the Protestants argued amongst themselves as well. Holy ecumenical schism, Batman! I know. Uh, way back in 1638, the Presbyterian people of Scotland signed the National Covenant. Uh, essentially, it was a document that said that no earthly power had sway over the Scottish Church, that Charles I couldn't impose the Anglican prayer book or Episcopalian ways on Scotland, and that landowners couldn't uh, place their ministers in local congregations as Episcopalians did. Uh, it started the Bishop's War, which went on to become the English Civil War. It was messy. Now, at the end of the day, uh, Presbyterians won out, uh, but about 200 years later, by that time, uh, by 1843, the landed gentry were getting up to their tricks again, and they were trying to impose ministers on local congregations. And one half of the Church of Scotland said, what's the problem? Another half said, we're not having this. They split off and formed the Free Church of Scotland. Yeah? Consequences? In New Zealand, there's a town called Dunedin, and in Stornoway, you can't buy a packet of fags on a Sunday. But you can't really do anything on a Sunday. Uh, they even lock up the children's play parks. Uh, I think because that's where the kids buy the fags. Anyway, uh, in the south of New Zealand, there's an area called Otago. Uh, Captain Cook was the first guy to map it. After that, there were whalers and seal clubbers would come to try and get their wares. Uh, a number of surveyors looked at the area and decided it was damp and dreek and unsuitable for colonisation. But the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland said damp and dreek, that's what we live for. And so uh, an assisted passage scheme was set up to provide places for upstanding men of good character. That's why the town is not called Paisley. And uh, this is a mock-up of uh, the ship that they travelled on. Uh, they sailed in these cramped conditions on the Philip Lang. This is my bunk, yeah? And <clears throat> uh, it left Greenock in November 1847, and not long after the John Wycliffe had left from further south. Uh, it arrived in Otago in April 1848. Uh, it was the world's longest migration trip, and many Scots followed after it. During that trip, people died, people were married, and children were born. You know what that means. In the confined and, let's be honest, somewhat public spaces of courts like this, people were having rumpy pumpy. Mm. Presbyterian church, ooh, minister, not on a Sunday. One of the main proponents for this scheme the leader and the minister on the Philip Lang and the first Presbyterian minister in this new uh, colony was called Thomas Burns. He was the, the nephew 
of our poet, Robert Burns. And I think that's why the statue that dominates the town centre is of our national bard. It's true. Um, it's also why the town to the south of Dunedin is named after Robert Burns's farm, Mosquito. Uh, if you go to Dunedin, the street names are Edinburgh street names. You'll see buses going to Kerstorfin, Portobello and Leith. In fact, the only way that you know that it's not the real Edinburgh is that here people actually talk to their neighbours. I know, weirdos. The local rugby team is called the Highlanders. Uh, they play a pipe band as the entertainment before the games. Uh, last night I was in a pub and I met this guy who's a tour guide in the area and he was Dutch born and came here when he was a boy when his parents emigrated and he was delighted to hear more about the history of Scotland so he could better understand the history and culture of his own town here. It's incredible. If you're looking for a bit of Scotland, uh, as far away from Scotland as you could possibly imagine, come to Dunedin. It's brilliant. The only thing I would say is that the other city in the South Island is called Christchurch, and that was settled by English Episcopalians. I know. Imagine coming all the way to the other side of the world to set up a Scots Presbyterian utopia, only to find that your neighbours are the very people you're trying to get away from in the first place. Nightmare. Question for today. Uh, I told you that the, the rugby team here is the Highlanders. What is the rugby team in Christchurch? Answers uh, in the comment section below. Uh, if you've liked this, please like the clip, share the clip, like and share the Facebook page, Scotland History Tours, and of course, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Scotland History Tours. I mean, Dawkins can be la ma live. Cheerio and Drasta.